I'm James Helder, welcome to Full Core Football 24. Quite privileged to be joined by former AFC Wimbledon man Simon Bassey. Firstly, Simon, how are you? Yeah, good, James. All good, mate. Thanks ever so much. Good. Now, yours is quite an interesting journey from playing at an academy to then having the setbacks to go through non league to then uh, carving out a career of AFC Wimbledon and eventually becoming the caretaker manager. Quite an interesting story and loads of facets to get into. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, obviously some journey and. You know, as a boy, all you want to do is, you know, play football, be a professional footballer, and I was no different, and uh, wasn't quite good enough in the end, you know, so went away, kind of tried to go for the non-league route and, and come back into the game, and then picked up a serious injury, which tell, uh, could tell that episode, and, and then found myself down the coaching route, and, and uh, managed to get there in the end, you know, with a... Uh, Several promotions with AFC Wimbledon, but yeah, to, to get into the league and obviously stay there and then get promoted was brilliant. Now, I know you're from South London, so what, what area would yeah. you have been brought up in? I was Elephant of Castle. I was born my family from Elephant of Castle. Um, we moved to just off of Wandle Road in Morden uh, when I was seven, I think six, seven. And uh, yeah, so we started sort of uh, living around, around this area and then... I think I first went to Wimbledon training. Uh, it's a funny, st- not, not a funny story at all, really. My parents' best friends from the Elephant of Castle, their son, who was my best friend, got run over and died um, when he was 10. And uh, he was a year older than two years older than me. And their other son trained at Wimbledon. Uh, he was four years older than me. So my parents used to go to training every time they trained, once a week to see his their friends and uh, I used to just go along and sit on the stairs and watch training and then kind of joined in a little bit and they kind of said you're not bad and uh, I think someone they sent someone down to, to watch me play uh, I think it might have been for the school team or for the Sunday team and yeah joined Wimbledon then just before me just before I was 10 I think what do you remember what's your first impressions of Wimbledon at that time because it's the crazy gang era yeah, it's the it's the era that a lot of people define Wimbledon with. What do you remember as a young child from that? Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I'm really really lucky in a way. I was uh, 1986, my first ever Wimbledon game. Uh, Leicester, we beat Leicester at home on a Saturday, and I remember going with my dad. I got a ticket to stand um, just to the side of the where the home end was, and. Uh, where we scored that in one one nil and I think that was me hooked then. You know, it was fantastic. And then when I used to go and watch my uh, friend train, they used to train behind the stand on a sort of triangle bit of tarmac, which was a bit different from the academies these days, uh, on concrete, but uh, brilliant, you know. And uh, that's where I sort of trained for probably three or four years when I first started at Wimbledon behind the stand on the triangle tarmac and uh, with pimple balls that used to kill you if they hit you on the leg. Um, but yeah, no, nah, I mean, brilliant time to start supporting Wimbledon, you know, first year in the old, old first division. Um, and we, we'd done great as a club. Obviously then the FA Cup followed two years later. And you know, I, I went to pretty much every home game for the next six years really, 10 to 16 was, uh, before I left at 16, so I pretty much went to every away game or every home game and, and some away game. So a great time to be a fan of Wimbledon. Now, you know yourself, a lot of footballers dreaded the thought of coming to Plough Lane. It yeah. was a place that they really didn't like. Us as fans, I don't think at the time we was aware of that. It was There was tickets being given away at local schools. Yeah. And I remember myself getting tickets as a boy to go and watch Wimbledon v Oldham yeah. back in the day and stuff. And I don't think we realised just how intimidating of a place that was to to rival rival footballers, if you like. Yeah, I mean, it's just say when you when you look, oh, that's all I knew as a kid. You know, it was, it was a game ground I went to every week, and it was all I thought they was all like that. You know, there weren't bundles on telly. Um, I mean, I <clears throat> we used to be ball boy quite a lot of the time, and you'd go in the down through the tunnel entrance and there'd be a big gym on the left you'd go in there pick your tracksuit out of the bag it was like one size fits all and I was tiny like so everything was hanging off me and then we used to have half hours worth of wrestling on the crash mat and then <laughs> then we'd go out and, and be ball boy but um, it was tight you know the, it was the dressing rooms the tunnel was tight yeah. 
remember John Fashion used to stand halfway out the dressing room door in a jock strap, all oiled up, six foot four, looked an absolute specimen. And he used to make the away team sort of walk around him to, to get past, to go to their dressing room. You know, so all the little tricks they used to play. And as I say, it was a tight pitch. And, you know, we, we certainly played forward and, and backed it up in them days and give teams a real hard time. So as, being, as well as being a Wimbledon fan, you've got the opportunity from a young boy to, to be around these sort of players, yeah. to train. What was the integration like amongst the young players in the senior team? Bearing in mind, I'm guessing things are a lot different to what they are now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it's, you know, Wimbledon was probably the only ground, certainly in the top flight, that had a nightclub. The players' bar turned into a nightclub after sort of nine o'clock. And, uh, you know, my mum and dad used to go and they'd have a drink in the bar. I used to just would be playing out in the in the car park, uh, you know, in the stands, running around and playing football and stuff. And then you'd go in and you'd get the same autographs every week. And there'd be players still in the players' bar, stroke nightclub at nine o'clock um, after games. And you know, it was brilliant. And they'd all sort of some would recognise you because you know we used to get their autograph every week. So <laughs> you know, it was a uh, it was a real kind of family uh, feel to it all and you know, certainly unusual for a top flight club. What was it like playing in the youth team and coming through the youth system at Wimbledon at that time? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I never got to the youth team. I left when I was 16, so I, I, uh, I came when I was sort of just before I was 10. I signed schoolboy forms when I was 14 for two years. That was brilliant, you know, meal with your family in the restaurant, or in the nightclub. You must have thought on top of the world at that yeah, point. Yeah, absolutely. On, you know, I've got a fit. I've got a new suit from Burton's. My mum bought me. Um, you know, and my photo done with Dennis Wise, who was probably one of my favourite players at the time, um, on the pitch, which was brilliant. You know, and and it's a real good sign of progression. That means you signed for the next two years at the club, and then if you're lucky enough, your next contract was 16, was an apprenticeship. Um, unfortunately for me, never got an, an apprenticeship at Wimbledon. Um, I was really small at the time and they just said, I think you're going to be too small for what we want. Um, that cut and shut? Pretty much, yeah, over the phone. Wow. You know, so, uh, and it was to me parents, like, it wasn't to me, to me parents, and then obviously my parents had to deliver it to me. How did your parents break that news to you at the time? Bearing in mind, you're very impressionable at 16. Yeah, um, well, my dad's a, my dad's a proper fella, <laughs> you know, he, uh, he don't sugarcoat nothing. There it is. That's the news. What are you going to do about it? You know, it's up to you. Sink or swim type thing. Um, so, yeah, I uh, I think I wrote to every club in the 92. Really? Yeah. I got one reply from Plymouth Argyle off of Peter Shilton saying, no thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, then I managed to get a trial at Cholton. Um, um, I'm not even sure how it come about, if I'm honest. Um I think it was my Sunday manager said they were looking for a couple, so I went to a, I went on trial one Sunday for Cholton, um, played a game, scored two, played really well, um, got pretty much offered a, a contract, a two-year apprenticeship off the back of that, sort of pretty much straight away, because I picked up a slight back injury then, I think it was just growing pains really, because when I left Wimbledon within a year I'd sort of grown five inches, so I think that was a part of, part of it. Um, but yeah, signed a two-year apprenticeship at Cholton, and then so that was that was my uh, my first stint at Wimbledon, sort of over with the first six years, and obviously devastated. But you know, you, you're out in the big wide world then, and you've got to kind of feed for yourself, and and off I went. So when you went to Charlton, who was the manager of the first team at Charlton when you joined? So the first year I went was joint managers Alan Kerbushy, Steve Grit. That was they was. Uh, I'd actually signed when Lenny Lawrence was the manager, and then they then it changed over the sort of summer. So I came in, and Steve Grit and uh, Alan Kerbishy were the managers, uh, joint managers. And to be fair, we didn't have a bundles to do with them. Alan Kerbishy always found was was good as gold. Um, but our youth team manager was brilliant. You know, he. Uh, I think anyone knows about football would know uh, John Cartwright his name was he was previously head of the FA Lily Shaw uh, real football man real purist in a way he wanted to play 
Um, so that was a real fantastic learning curve for me for two years then really opened my eyes to, to different systems, different shapes. You know, we talk about false nines now, they talk about Barcelona false nine, we played false nine in 1992, you know, and uh, he was he was revolutionary in the stuff that he was doing and really, really, really interested to work for. You know, he probably didn't appreciate it at the time, but when I look back now and see some of the stuff he'd done, you know, it was fantastic. So are you playing every week in the youth team for Charlton then? Are you, are you then looking to, to yeah. make that step up? First year, my first year as an apprentice, I've done really well. You know, I was playing in the youth team, made a few uh, sub appearances in the reserves and was doing really well. I was kind of sort of crossroads in my kind of career really. We had a boy a year older than me, he was a second year, a guy called Paul Linger didn't really go on to achieve what he what he should have because he was a hell of a footballer um really good player and he was more of an attacking midfield player so i kind of just tried to be more of a defensive kind of type um which was different to how I, i'd been before but i don't know whether i didn't think i was as good as him or i knew that he was going to get a pro so i had to kind of try and f do the other stuff because he was good, wasn't going to give two of us one. Um, so I kind of tried to change my game a little bit uh, then. And then obviously when I become a second year, Lee Bowyer, who's now the manager, was a, came in and was a first year. Um, and he was pff, something else. Did you know straight away, first time or second time, of seeing Lee Bowyer, that he would go on to do something in the game? Yeah, I mean, he, you always hear they talk highly in school holidays, they might come in. I mean, he could run backwards faster than most of us could run forwards, like forever. He was fit as anything, and and uh, and could run all day. Technically good, you know. So you knew that, you know, you had your work. I had me work cut out a little bit, and then really I, I picked an injury up in a Southern Junior Floodlit Cup game, pretty early on in the season, probably about a sixth game in, um, and I was out for probably three months with that. And then when I came back, wasn't really playing as much. And I was always one of them. I'd, sort of, I'd want to know why, so I'd go and knock on the manager's door. And he'd sort of pretty much early on just said, look, we don't, we've got him above you, we've got him below you. You know, we're not sure there's not going to be anything here for you. So that was fine, you know, and, and off I went again. I was lucky, really, because it was a good club, Charlton, the senior pros were brilliant. Um, Alan Pardew lived not far from me uh, at the time. Alex Dyer lived uh, a couple of roads from me, where I live now. He used to live a couple of roads away at the time. So I used to spend a lot of time after games, they'd give me a lift home and stuff like that instead of getting a train. And they were brilliant to me, like, I used to go and watch football around their house and stuff. Um, and it was brilliant, like so they were fantastic for me. So it must have been a great education for you as a young player to be around these sort of faces and guys and getting yeah. getting knowledge off them. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to Alex, you know, he used to take me around his house, try and give me becks, and uh, we'd listen. To, he had a million records, some of the greatest records ever. Like it was, fat. he loved his music. So we'd be watching a football and go, just listen to this music, <laughs> listen to this record. You know, and he was he was a, such a good guy. Um, and then when I left, obviously, I said, anything we can do, like, just let us know. And Alan Pardew said to me, look, my old non-league manager, a guy called Billy Smith, go and see him, he'll look after you. So I went, to, I went to Carshorton, where Billy Smith was the manager, and uh, and played there, stayed there for, three, for the next three years, I think. Fair play to Alan Pardew. Yeah, and he was a senior pro. Alan Pardew then, um, but yeah, he'd, he'd sort of, obviously he came through non-league himself, Dali Jamley at Yeovil, so, you know, he knew, he knew how, how it worked down there, and uh, he sent me to Carl Shorten, and that was, a, that was an adventure for an 18-year-old boy, I must admit. You ended up playing 150 games for Carl Shorten over two spells, just over 150 was games. It, yeah? Fantastic achievement. What, firstly, I'd like to look at as a young player, coming from that, academy life set up yeah. to then non-league football grown men mm. mortgages anger yeah how did you how did you adapt how did you handle that um again i was i was still pretty small at the time 
they were shot up in height to all five foot eight of me now probably I was you know probably eleven and a half stone um, just started working so I left then started working on the building sites um, and was sort of up at five days work training in the evening with say with men and there were some real men at Carl Shorten at that time some uh, some big drinkers big herberts um, and it was a it's a real eye opener for me but I, I loved it I must admit I loved being part of it um, they were super protected of me um, the, the, the good ones the, the, you know always if you can get a strong one to look after you you're even better um, but now they were brilliant with me um, and I was pretty game but they was always there to protect me so um, yeah, it was a brilliant. I loved it there. It was uh, it was fantastic. How long did you spend there in your first girl? I think I spent two years, two and a half years there at first. Oh yeah, it might have been two and a half years. I think I left. I left when I was twenty one. Um, and I'd had some interest. I'd had Alan Pardew had sent. Um, I think Ray Clements uh, down to see. Uh, to come and watch me and I'd had an absolute stinker when he came um, so there was yeah there was a bit of interest and there was a lot of rumours that clubs were looking at me um, I was doing well so I was sort of 18 and a half playing in the first team uh, and doing well when we was doing quite well as a club so it was a great shot window for me and uh, yeah probably two and a half years and then I got um, I ended up going to all the shop which was a uh, was a real good football club. Was it know, higher up the lower, divisions and lower, lower than yeah. Costa? Yeah, you know, I'd a, I'd a Yeovil were interested in taking me in the conference. Um, I'd sort of not long been with my now wife. Yeovil was, mm, I don't know, all the shot was, was fantastic, you know, proper football club. Just coming back from obviously the problems that it, it had, financial problems it had, and working its way back through the league. So I dropped down a league, but really only for probably four months because I think I went in the January and we got promoted at the end of that season to the level I was playing at with Carl Shorten. So um, I sort of took a long-term game goal with that and uh, it was working perfectly for me. You know, it, it was a fantastic football club. I'd gone from having 300 fans at uh, Carl Shorten to having sort of two and a half, three thousand at Aldershot. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, the sort of, they're the sort of times you play non-league football for, you know hard day's work, it was tough, but as soon as you went out, you know, that really got your juices going. How long would you have spent at Aldershot? And well, was there interest from, from other teams during your time there? Yeah, I think Reading, I, f I first went there, I'd done well. I think Reading, Colchester um, were interested pre-season. I'd done really well against Colchester and uh, I later found out that they, they were coming back to watch quite heavily. Um, and then three games into the next season, I snapped me knee, and that was me 15 months out um, at Aldershot. So I was 21 and a half then. Um, Do you remember the tackle that did it or yeah, the incident? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a good lesson, really, because as you say, I I was well looked after at Car Shorten and probably opened my mouth once too often, and then a year later. The, Someone took their retribution. Um, it's a bad tackle, but as you say, it's football. I'd say I probably opened my mouth too, once too often and he shut it for me. So, uh, yeah, you live and learn. You know, they're, all, they're the lessons that you, you get dealt in life. So it was a tough one to take. You know, I was sort of thought I was just making headway into it and then 15 months out was a, was a real, a real sort of career ender really we in see, terms of my chance to get back in the game as a pro we see players at a professional standard suffer an injury like that and find it very difficult to get back yeah even with the physios the physiotherapy the treatment rooms how do you handle such an injury like that when you're playing at non-league level tough it was tough i just started doing the knowledge at the time to be a taxi driver because you couldn't start then until you were 21 and three months i think yeah so I was kind of looking at it thinking I need to do something to back the football up if it doesn't go well or as I hope. 
and get back in the game so I started doing that and then obviously the knee so that put a, a stop to the knowledge for a while um, so the physio was brilliant at all the shop but part time you know it was a couple we had to have a bucket collection to get the money to have the operation this is you know this is 1995 you know so it was it was it was a long time ago and surgery weren't as as cultured as it is now you know i think i've got say two screws and a eight inch guard down the middle of me uh me left knee so yeah it was a, it was a long road back you know at older shop Underneath the stand, one leg, one leg curl machine. That was pretty much it. You just have to put a roll of wallpaper under your leg to get the right um, balance. Yeah, so it was tough, and as you say, but them days now they're talking about six to eight months. You know, for me it was fifteen back in them days. So it was a, it was a huge amount of time, and it probably uh, it probably knocked me a little bit if I'm honest. I bet it's such a serious injury. When you're trying to aspire to get to a good level with anything, to such a such, suffer such a huge setback, so definitely a real difficult thing to deal with. Yeah, yeah, and it's a lot to say. I, I spend a lot of time with injured people since, and you know, try and be around them and try and sort of keep them involved and all that because I know what happens when you're not. You know, there's some there's some dark places there. Luckily, obviously, I've got fantastic family. Um, my wife at the time was my girlfriend, really supportive. Um, so I had a great support network, but you know not everyone's that lucky. So just trying to be around people, trying to keep them positive, because as you say, you spend so much time alone, and sometimes you don't see the end of it. You know, one the knee for me, one day I'd be sort of three quarter pace, thinking I'm I'm close. Next day I couldn't hardly walk. You know it was kind of that sort of roller coaster, um, which was pretty common back back in them days with the injury. It must have been a huge thing for you to deal with emotionally as well yeah. are you going to be able to get close to playing are you going to be able to get to the standard you was at before yeah, always the worry you know always the worry but you know I'm, I'm a pretty determined guy you know I get me head down I focus I'm an hard worker you know so I didn't cut any corners I've done everything that I had to do and, and more probably um, and I knew I'd get there eventually and you know you sort of hope yeah, you just fingers crossed and hope all the good work you do comes reward you when you can come back 15 months after suffering such a huge injury are you then back playing football are you then back training how did the rehabilitation period yeah how did you ease yourself back into the game quite good the manager was quite good with me to be fair you sort of you start off you go back in joining training you do all, you've done all your straight line stuff then you start your cutting and twisting turning Obviously then you're back in the, the training, normally the spare man, so no one can tackle you for the first couple of weeks just to get you back involved. And then pretty quickly I, I got back involved and came on a sub in a, in a, I think it was an FA Cup game. Um, yeah, and it was just, it was brilliant for me, you know, just to, to go back out on the pitch and you know, get a clap and, and then you get a clump on it and get up and you think, okay, it's fine. There's a confidence comes from that. And uh, yeah, then sort of up and away and and trying to sort of get back going, really. What was the next chapter for yourself after that? Well, didn't it didn't go great. Um, end of that season, I think I had a year left at all the shop. Um, the manager decided that he wanted me to leave. Um, so we had a we had a little issue over. What was what was owed on the contract and stuff, so we got that sorted, and and I left. To be fair, I'm not one of them who wants to stay around where I'm not wanted. You know, I just wanted to play. I'd had a long time out. I just wanted to get back playing. Um, and I think I went back to Car Shorten. Um, back to the Bash Brothers and the protection. Yeah, they were different then. It was a few. It was a few. They'd gone, so the it kind of it was evolving a different sort of set of lads. But again, it was you know five minutes from my house. It would give me a chance to play football. Um, but it was difficult, you know, when I talk about coming back and playing and three and a half hours in the order shot to go then back to 300 at Car Shorten and, you know, the knee's a bit sore and, you know, you've been on the building site all day or you've been doing the knowledge on the moped, it's, it's, it's difficult. So, uh, yeah, I came back and, and played, but I kind of, I picked up a, 
an issue which really ended up finishing my career really it was kind of a degenerative cartilage issue where I'd end up I'd play then sort of some of the cartilage would come away I'd have to go and have an op have it cut a little bit more cut out then I'd rehab for a month and then come back you know I was doing that kind of twice a year getting the knee cleared out um, it sounds pretty heavy duty just to enable you to play yeah it was but it was what I wanted to do you know it's what I've always always wanted to do but at that time then you know you sort of my girlfriend was then my fiance you buy a house it's, I'm now self-employed I've, I've uh, passed the knowledge to be a London taxi driver so now you're self-employed all this time off it's costing you money so um, I kind of floated around a couple of clubs I think I went to Dulwich Jamlet with a couple of pals and played a few games I played a few games at two in a Mitchum with some of my pals um, and it, it was never the same you know I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna be a pro which was the always the dream I wasn't going to be a pro anymore um, I was going to be a taxi driver for 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 a period of time and then I was going to pack up really I decided to pack up in that summer 2002 and then IFC Wimbledon started which was uh, really the, the take off of the, the roller coaster you know it was a friend of mine who I played at car shorten with he knew the guy who was going to be the manager of AFC Wimbledon said, uh, what you? I said, I'm not going to play, I'm finished, and he's gone. And he said, no, no, he said, you'll be able to play at that level. He said, they're playing step nine. He said, you'll be able to play that level with one leg. So I said, all right. It was, okay, I'll go. So I went down, I think the third pre-season game of the first ever year. Um, we got beat 9-1 at Walton and Ursham, I think it was. And it was horrendous. I sat there thinking, Jesus Christ. But it was it was eleven, twelve hundred people there, you know, Wimbledon fans. And I thought this is alright. I can you know, I've played. So I decided to give it a bash and, and there we were, I've played the first two years. I mean the first season we played. Fantastic crowds, three thousand at home, you know, we finished third with hundred and eleven points. Um, which was a mental in itself so they, yeah then played the next year we we went unbeaten the whole year i think we drew four games the whole year uh we won the league with i think it was 130 points um got promoted and at the end of that year i sort of had another operation on my knee um the manager changed the new manager had come in a guy called dave anderson um and I've got myself super fit, you know, in the summer I'd had an operation, got myself done all my rehab, thought I'd give this a real good crack. And then probably towards the end of pre-season, you know, I was playing, but every game I'd play two days, spend in a, what was called then a Kyra cuff, which is basically an ice compression machine, you used to wrap it around your knee, carry it, uh, this little cool box around, flush it through to get the compression into your knee. So you're literally carrying your cooler box around with you for the week? Yeah, for two days, yeah. yeah. So I'd, if I'd be on the building site or whatever, and you'd sort of flush your knee, sleep in it. Because so, every time I played, it just blew up. Um, so I'd keep that on to keep the keep the compression away. And, you know, Saturday to Saturday, I could pretty much get away with it two days. So you're basically living and training like a lower league Ledley King to a certain extent. Yeah, isn't yeah, kind of. So kind that's of, bizarre. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, fair play to him for what he, the yeah. performances he put in at that level. Yeah. But saying that, he didn't have to go on the building site every no, day. No, good point. So, yeah, yeah. Bit, bit yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, so at the end of that pre-season, Dave Anderson, uh, he pulled me at the start of the actual start of when he came in and he'd sort of, I didn't know him, but we sort of knew each other because he came from sort of the higher level that I'd sort of been playing my career at and uh, he sort of took over and he said, come on, give me the, uh, give me the rundown. And I went, okay, this needs to be better, that needs to be better. You know, so he's asking your opinion on the club, opinion on, on the, the setup, on, the on what's club, going on, on the yeah. players, on the you know, yeah. a real low level to, you know, just the step up, and he'd come 
and he'd wanted to take the club forward. So what did he need to do? So I gave him the sort of the uh, the skinny on that, so to speak, and you know we got on great just talking. And he was, you know, he was really good with me. He pulled me into the pre-season and said, "Listen, I'm probably not going to play. Uh, you know, the, the knee ain't no good for you. Um, I'd really like you to coach the reserves." So that's your first step into your the coaching steps, ladder. Yeah, I was yeah. 27, I think. Wow. You know, but ultimately it meant stopping playing. Um, so I, I undenied about it, and ultimately I, I didn't really want to leave Wimbledon, you know, at that time certainly. So um, I said, okay, yeah, brilliant. So I started doing the reserves with a guy called John Morris, who was Dave's friend, who was a lovely old fella. Um, sadly passed away now but a real good guy Fulham fan a lovely bloke and he was brilliant you know Bass just do what you want you know you take everything he just done all the admin kind of stuff and made the phone calls and just left everything in terms of the training and, and stuff to me so it was a great learning curve for me really you know you've sort of thrown in at the sort of deep end a little bit without real pressure of, of having to win games but you know I like winning so you know, that pressure comes from within, so, you know, we set about it, and I think we done it for two years, two and a bit years, I mean, we won a couple of cups, we come runners-up in the league, I think we won one year, come runners-up the next year, um, and uh, I really enjoyed it, we got some good kids in, uh, yeah, well, we, we got a boy called Chris Hussey, and he was the first one, really, we took through, um, we ended up selling him to Coventry for... 300 grand I think it was uh, at the time in the championship um, and that was brilliant he was the first one really that you know when I spoke to off camera about helping about finding that that uh, role in, in coaching and finding your pathway in life really mine was I loved helping people you know getting them in putting my arm around them working with them finding out what they can do can't do seeing the improvement of a player Absolutely, over yeah. a period of time yeah we used to you know Chris was a brilliant kid, real keen learner, come out of Shepherd's Bush, you know, just wanted some guidance. You know, I'd come in, we'd come in hour and a half before everyone else. We'd do Ed tennis, he could only, he was a left foot, a beautiful left foot, couldn't use his right foot, so I'd say, no, no, right foot only for you. We'd play right foot only, and then we'd do, you know, right foot after training, crossing, back post heading, which he weren't good at. We'd, you know, we spent so much time working on him. He was kind of the first project and, you know, to then see him come through the reserves, go into the first team. Um, and then eventually, as I say, when I, I moved up to the first team as well, and um, then we ended up selling him to, to Coventry for, I say, we got him, he got released from Woking youth team at 16. So you've done, from your point of view, what a job you've done. Brilliant, yeah. From being released at Woking to yeah. then playing at Wimbledon and then 300k signing for Coventry. Signing for Coventry, Huge. yeah. And he still, I still speak, she still rings now for advice and stuff and, you know, he's a real good kid, you know, he's, uh, and he's had a good career, you know, so I take a lot of pride in seeing how, how he's developed over time. He's now, he's now a dad, you know, so not just as a player, as a person, how, how you help him mature and grow up and, you know, he's a, he's a real good kid, Chris. I'm really proud of everything he's done. Talk to me about making that step up to work with the first team squad. Yeah, um, obviously Dave Anderson was the uh, first team manager and I'd done the reserves towards, I think we'd got promoted the first year, the second year we'd lost in the playoff final and then it was sort of, David sort of said, next year I'd like you to work uh, with me in the first team. I think his assistant had a bad back at the time, so he, he'd missed a sort of few games and David sort of took me up to work with him. So he'd kind of asked me to okay it with the board and, and whatever to promote me to the first team. Um, and then unfortunately we lost in the playoff final when he got a sack. Um, so that was, you know, disappointing for Dave because he was a, a smashing fella uh, and taught me a lot really. Um, but then Terry Brown, who, uh, again, I didn't know, but I knew of, and, and the same with me, uh, was heavily linked to the job with his assistant was Stuart Cash, whose son now plays for Aston Villa, Matt Cash. 
he I'd played with Stuart at Aldershot, so I knew Stuart, so I'd spoke to Stuart on the phone again, told him a little bit about the club and the squad and, and whatever. They ended up getting the job, um, and the chairman sort of said, you know, we'd offered Simon a coaching role um, previously under Dave, would you honour that? And they both said, yeah, no problem. So that was my first step up to the first team with, with Terry, and, you know, Terry was a wily old non-league manager, he'd been around, uh, played against his teams quite a bit, he was, you know, they were tough and strong and he was kind of trying to change the way he played, you know, he, he got to that age, he says, where he, he had to enjoy watching them, he, it wasn't just about winning for him anymore, he wanted to sort of enjoy it a little bit more and he and we'd done a great job, you know, got out of the Ryman Premier at the time, I think we finished third. You know, and there was big pressure there at Wimbledon. I just felt the momentum within the club was just for the first time wavering a little bit. The crowds were, you know, dropping off a few hundred. And I think if we'd have stayed in the Ryman Premier for another year, we'd have probably lost 500 fans easy. Um, but we managed to get up. We managed to get into the playoff final and won in the last couple of minutes. And that was a, a fantastic day. You know, brilliant for Terry, brilliant for everyone involved and, you know, ultimately brilliant to ignite Wimbledon again. You know, we worked really hard to improve the team. Um, we'd sort of, we'd got a team that year just to get us out of the league. It was all about just getting the job done. We'd managed to do that with senior pros, you know, Rob Quinn, we had Jake LeBeau, Jason Goodliffe, Marcus Gow was playing centre-half then. You know, so we'd, we'd brought players in just to do the job and, and we got the job done. So um, that was good. And then we went into the Conference South the next year and it was it was a big jump really, you know, for, for when we didn't really know what to expect. Um, and we absolutely obliterated it. We were, we, we were brilliant, you know. One of the probably, probably the most enjoyable, let's say, it's, it's, hard, it's a big statement, really enjoyed the season. I think we finished top. Uh, we played really good football. We were probably better than the league, you know, from from the start. I think the start of the first game of the season, we went to Newport County, who were meant to be one of the favourites, and won four one. You know, so we set our stall out early and never really uh, came away from it. Obviously, there's there's tough spells in seasons, but we always felt that we had enough in the dressing room to get through it. We we developed really good spirit. You know, we we'd become uh, good at recruiting good people, you know, people that you'd want to spend time with, you want to be in a dressing room with. Um, and yeah, we had a we had a real good spirit and, and finished the season and, um, and got promoted to the conference, which was, you know, amazing. I think Wimbledon had said they wanted to get back into the Football League in 10 years, you know, which was, a I thought at the time, was a ludicrous statement because... We wasn't heavily backed, you know, by finances. I don't think we'd ever had the highest budget in any league that we'd played in. So, you know, to do it in, in 10 years, I thought was um, was impossible. Um, and we went into the conference full of big clubs, you know, full of established clubs, full of ex-league clubs, you know, and we'd just come from the Combine Counties not so long ago. Um, we were part-time, you know, in, in a predominantly full-time league. Um, but we had a we had a good go. We kept a, we had a youngest group, um, but we'd done well, and I think we finished eighth that season, first year in the conference, um, the highest part time team in the conference that year. We finished eighth, um, and then that that summer was the big one where we changed over and transferred to going full time, um, which was brilliant, you know, hard really hard work because financially it wasn't paying full time certainly for someone who had a, a young baby and a mortgage you know so I'd I'd be working in the morning in the cab I'd had a regular customer I used to take to Euston station at sort of quarter past six come back take training in the daytime go back after training, pick him up, bring the, the regular customer back home, then go work for a bit, you know, involving, you normally get two games a week watching, uh, just trying to recruit players that way, 
keeping your sort of your knowledge up like that. So it was a it was an absolute whirlwind few years really. Sort of that time financially, as say the money wasn't great, but you know it was a again a great wife who was supportive and knew it was my passion and and knew she had to probably see bring my daughter up a little bit on her own because I was I was out. I was out chasing the dream, so to speak. Um, yeah, and you know, it was brilliant. And then the next year, to say the full time year, again, we got together a really good team, some really good players, good blend of youngsters and some experience. And I think we finished second that year behind Crawley, who was spending a fortune, you know, ahead of. Luton, head of Mansfield, head of some York at the time, some really big clubs. Um, we finished second, and um, Fleetwood. We played Fleetwood in a semi-final of the playoffs. Won two 0 at Fleetwood, and they were a good team. That was I think the year before Jamie Vardy went there, um, and we we beat them two 0 away from home. Brought them back, and I think we beat them six at home in the second leg, I think it was six, um, but an, again another amazing night, you know, to win, to win the playoffs in that style, in the semi-final in that style, and then obviously the final against Luton at the City of Manchester Stadium was, um, was probably the most nervous I've ever been. Um, Do you think that's the biggest game you've been involved with as a coach up to date? Yeah, yeah, yeah because it was the end of that group otherwise you know it was the end of that group pretty much anyway because other teams come and took them off us yeah. but we wasn't financially strong enough to be to stave off you know interest from teams so Danny Kedwell was our best player he left for, for money um, you know we got money for him he obviously got better money elsewhere Stephen Gregory was brilliant for us you know signed him for we signed kids for ten grand and sold him for hundred and fifty or whatever. You know, Stephen Gregory we sold we bought for eight grand from Hayes, sold him on to Bournemouth a really good profit for us as well. But I remember sitting there before the before the game, funny enough, and I I was all I was never really one who got nervous, but I remember going into the toilet and just sort of having a deep breath thinking, This is our chance, this is our one chance because I think we were fifteenth in the budget table. We didn't really have any right to be in the uh, in the playoff final, really, you know. And I knew how hard we'd work to get that group together, and I knew that if we'd got beat, definitely that group would break up, and then we'd have a real job on our hands trying to replace the players that we were going to lose and be competitive again the next year. So yeah, I had a real deep breath and thought, "Come on, we can do this." and you know, it was it was probably not the, well. It was a decent game, nil nil, decent nil nil. I'd say, um, and then it probably will always be remembered for the for the penalties, for the penalty shootout, and obviously Keds <clears throat> was uh, was our captain at the time and our our, our leader really, and uh, for him to probably in the script for him to score the winning penalties to take us up, but. You know, in nine years, you know, I thought they were joking when they said ten years, we managed to do it in nine. Um, and it was, yeah, it was amazing, you know. from These people had started a football club nine years ago without any idea what they were doing, if I'm honest. Nine years later, they're in the Football League, bought their own, bought a, a ground, and they're in the Football League. You know, it was amazing. Um, grown men crying. Um, that team really written itself into AFC Wimbledon yeah. folklore and history, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and it should do. You know, there's a there's a lot said about um, going back to Plough Lane and everything. You know, this AFC Wimbledon story is unbelievable, and you know what Wimbledon done back in the day was brilliant. You know, coming through the leagues, what AFC Wimbledon done in the nine years and since is nothing short of miraculous what they've achieved. You know, and all of the players. Um, should be heroes to everyone because you know it's an unbelievable feat. Talk to me about the next season. How did that manifest? It was all right. It was okay. Um, obviously, good, but disappointing. We lost uh, our two best players really. 
in, in Danny Kidwell and Stephen Gregory. Um, we'd worked hard, we brought some in, we brought Jack Midson in from Oxford, I think it was, um, who was completely different to Danny, but you know, would, we thought would be a good player at the level, um, which proved to be to be right. We had fantastic momentum, you know, we had a, bearing in mind we wasn't paying a lot of money, so we had a lot of kids, a lot of 21 year olds, 20. People, sort of, players with things, something to prove. Really. Yeah, players with something to prove. Players who have been released from other clubs who we were given a second chance to, you know, but perfect for, for, for Terry, perfect for me. Players who come in, wanted to learn, yeah. wanted to listen, you know, wanted to work hard. And they were kind of the requisites we looked at when we tried to recruit players. Um, yeah, and we sort of hit the ground running and we, we were doing really, really well. I think we were third in October. Um, they do laugh, the boys laugh now. We we were third in October, we played Morecambe 1-2-0 away from home. And uh, I had a part, I had a bit of a party on the bus on the way back. This is, we were still, people were still drinking on the bus in them days. So we had, had, had us having a bit of a party, music was going, I think a couple of them had their t-shirts off, dancing. Um, and I don't think we won a game for two and a half months after that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it's sort of about bringing you down to earth you know and I think maybe that was probably the end of it in terms of that group you know they'd probably achieved so much yeah. it come to a stage where they thought they'd cracked it and as soon as you think you cracked it in this game you, you're over you know as soon as you lose that edge you know you're flat so you you cut corners you lose your edge and I think we probably just took their eye off the ball a little bit, maybe the staff as well. But um, yeah, we 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 finished fifteenth in the end, uh, which was, you know, quite a good uh, quite a good finish to the year really. Um, final our first year in the league was quite a, quite a good finish. But yeah, it was tough. It was uh, it was tough, and I think going forward from then it was proving to be tougher. Did the board insist on a management change at that point? How did that play out? No, I mean Terry was Terry. Obviously, our form towards the end of the season hadn't been great. Um, we changed um, quite a few players in that summer. Um, probably not. Probably not the right changes. Looking back, you know we. I suppose when you've got limited budget, it's hard to get it right every difficult. season. Yeah, it's difficult. You make one mistake and you lose a big chunk of your budget, your wage is available. Yeah. It's sort of hard to change yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, so if you get if you get two out of five right, they reckon you've done well. Mm. At Wimbledon, you have to get four out of five right. Um, and we made a couple of mistakes, certainly. Um, it didn't go well. You know, it didn't go well to the... Uh, the start of the season and um, Terry ended up um, losing his job you know at the end at the end of it which was as I say from my point of view really sort of sad because he was such a good guy what he'd achieved at that club you know in the f I think was six years he was there and what he'd achieved was was unbelievable you know he he's had lots of issues with his wife and, and stuff off the pitch. Um, but the man's a credit, you know, every day turned up, you know, focused, ready to work, you know, was a was a absolute diamond to work with. And, you know, Stuart um, was still probably working at that time, you know, when he was in the football league, he had a good job. So he didn't really, he didn't really come in maybe once a week. So, I got to work with Terry really closely, and at that time, you know, we had a, we had the training ground, but it was not very good. You know, we'd only just sort of had it two years. We were we were in like a broom cupboard, me and Terry as an office. We had a bit of uh, carpet I got off one of the old players who was a carpet fitter. I said, "Get me some carpet for the office." He gave us white, <laughs> white carpet, which didn't go well with the football boots on it every morning. Um, so yeah, we had like a little heater, me and Terry had one desk, shared a desk. Um, so I got to work really close with him and as I say, what a, what a great fella. Really, really enjoyed my time with him and, and, and learned a lot. 
Yeah. After his tenure was over, his departure, mm -hmm. no doubt there's a point where the club are looking for managers. Am I yeah. right in thinking you were brought in to, to steady the ship a little bit? Yeah. Um, four, I'd done four games of that spell, so it was weird, really, because I was still quite a young uh, you know, coach. I'd only been coaching in full-time in the Football League for a year, although I'd done sort of two years full-time previously in the, in the conference and stuff. Um, so, yeah, it, they sort of asked me, funny, they, they asked me to apply for the job. They said, we want you to apply for the job and take the uh, caretaker manager. So I said, OK. Um, but I was doing everything on my own. You know, I think they'd asked someone to uh, to help me in the youth department and, and they declined. So they said, if you want to bring someone in, you know, you can do so. I brought Dave Lee and a friend of mine called Dave Lee, who was uh, ex Chelsea centre half. He was a good friend of mine, so I just sort of said, "Come in and just sort of kind of watch me back and 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 see anything that I don't see. You can pick up great, like you know, just give me a different opinion." Uh, he came in and, and done it for four games. Uh, he lived in Bristol, so he came down and stayed down and 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 done a great job for me. Really helpful. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a real funny situation because obviously I was immensely proud, you know, so proud to be uh, Wimbledon manager, even though I was really sort of disappointed that Terry had lost his job because I class him as a friend, um, and he he sort of gave me my chance and and was a great guy. Um, yeah, we went away to Wickham first game and and we won one nil, so that was brilliant. Uh, obviously, we hadn't we hadn't won for a while. Um, we hadn't kept a clean sheet for a while. So to go away and win one 0 on the on the first game was was fantastic. Uh, and then I ended up doing four games um, as caretaker. I think we won two, lost two. Um, yeah, went and was interviewed by the board. Um, went back for a second interview with my 2B assistant. Um, so they said that was sort of, I think first of them, there were six of us, and then they cut it down to three, so I got to the final three in that, and then interviewed um, Dave Bassett was there, there was a psychologist there, um, and done that interview. So that was good for me, a good, another say, another good learning curve. Didn't really want the job, if I'm honest. Um, you know, did I think I could do it? Yeah, because I was doing it, but obviously wanted to be involved, so um, ended up they gave the job to Neil Wardley, and um, it was probably the right decision at the time, if I'm honest, and um, I was kind of in limbo a little bit, didn't know what was going to happen with me. The club had said, you know, really it was a two-man job, and you'd probably, you know, we'd probably move you on. Um, I met Neil Wardley, he sort of said, listen, while you're, you're going to have to give him money to go, I'd rather keep him. I had to then agree to having no sort of severance pay at the end of the season if I was to, to leave, which was yeah, fine by me. Fair play to Neil Wardley though. Yeah, yeah. Knowing that yourself had been up for the job as well. Yeah, I think he knew that I, I wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't me who was sort of applying for the job they told me to apply for it really yeah. you know so and again football's a small world you talk to people they tell you you know yeah. I'm I'm an honest guy and I'm a loyal guy so you know I think no one ever thinks that I'm going to uh, stitch them up go behind their back that ain't, that ain't me never will be so um, I think pretty much word of that what I'm like would have reached him certainly um, but yeah met him and obviously Neil was brilliant because you know he'd come out of an academy um, environment, uh, and he said, you know, you know everything about this club, you know everything about this league, you know everything about all the teams we're playing, you know, give me your knowledge. I need your knowledge. Um, so I gave him everything I could in terms of that. He was brilliant, sharing stuff uh, with me, uh, coaching stuff and, and bits and pieces like that. You know, and we used to have really good chats uh, about it going forward. And it was a tough job at that time. You know, the team probably wasn't good enough 
um, and we need it to get to January um, to try, try, try to and make try some and signings and, yeah. and get some reinvestment. Absolutely, yeah. So we we kind of limped our way to January, um, you know, and and that's kind of for me pleasing really that I got the two wins uh, in the four games as well because to say the team probably weren't good enough, but we managed to get to get some points out of it, which was which was fantastic, and ultimately in the end. We managed to stay up, but January was huge for us. You know, we, you know, at one point it looked like two of the deals weren't going to happen, and we'd sort of waited. We were laying on the floor in the bar, waiting for the phone to ring. Uh, me, Neil, and Neil Cox, um, and then we got to seven o'clock, and he said, "It's not going to happen. Just go home. Like finished. We've got what we've got." So we went home, and I think it was two and a half hours later, something like that. He rung up back on back on so we will go back to the club and uh, we we signed Gary Alexander uh, from Brent from Crawley I think or from Brentford one of the two and we signed Alan Bennett um, from Cheltenham both captains both men both leaders um, and they were just what we were looking for and uh, they came in and, and we kind of changed the way we played a little bit you know, we were quite direct, we played the stats more than anything, you know, final third entries, box entries, runs in behind, uh, corners, set pieces, you know, we played, we certainly had to find ways to win games and, and that was the key and, you know, it, it went tighter than we, we'd hoped, certainly, to the last game of the season. Um, Fleetwood at home and then, obviously, we got the penalty, Gary Alexander scored early on and then we got the penalty to to win it to to keep us up which was a, an incredible achievement really from where we were um, and testament to a lot of hard work that we put in to get this team where it was at the end of the season especially against Fleetwood a penalty as well to keep you up to keep us up yeah after having the history with Fleetwood yeah in the past in the past yeah and yeah. it was funny because I think Neil Cox says he was an apprentice with Graham Alexander at Scunthorpe, and he said uh, Graham's a good guy, like, and he was always good, Graham. But we were two one up; they had nothing to play for. They were putting another centre forward on, centre half up front. Like, <laughs> I said, "You sure he likes you?" <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we listen. We managed to see it out, and there were some some fantastic celebrations after because, just say, to work so hard to get where we were, it would have been a real crime. Um, to go back down and, and ultimately at the time we wasn't a f we wasn't really a football league club yeah. you know we was kind of punching above our weight our infrastructure was still you know in the infancy stage yeah really non-league a lot of the stuff we, we was doing was non-league but we were sort of I'd say financially we never had a, the money to improve it so we was doing the best we could and it, we just needed to keep staying in there and just generate some more money to keep improving and keep grinding through it really and that was always the uh that was always really the sp from the from the chairman and stuff was like you know we we take promotion to the football league because promotions are hard to get um are we ready for it no but we'll take it and we'll we'll fight too for now to stay up and to grow and and ultimately that's what we did over the next few years now i know he's had a successful period neil wardley at the club for a couple of years yeah when he departed, did you expect automatically to get the caretaker role again at the club? Was that something that was initially put to you? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't really put to me as such. Um, yes is the answer I, I expected to be put in charge because um, obviously I'd done it before and I was the only one really there who, who was... Um, who had any idea about it? So you so, were more, you had more seniority than some of the other coaches, having had that experience as yeah, I mean, it, manager. I mean, Alan Reeves was uh, the under twenty three coach, <clears throat> but obviously I was, you know, I was always Wimbledon's man kind of thing. You know, I, I wasn't Neil Wildley's man; he inherited me. I wasn't Terry Brown's man; he inherited me. I wasn't Dave Anderson's man; he inherited me. I was uh, Simon Bassey working hard for AFC Wimbledon and and AFC Wimbledon recognising that I was good at what I'd done and, and kind of going with me because, you know, I'd sort of made I'd made good signings for them. We'd made some good money for them. I'd, you know, we'd, we'd had a lot of promotions. In. You'd put the interest of the club ahead of 
yourself in a lot of situations. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the way I am. I'm, I'm never one who who seeks the limelight. I'm really kind of a head down, work hard in the background, you know. And and I think a lot of people don't uh, probably give me the credit in a way for some of the stuff that's that's gone on that I was was a part of. You know, I was there for a long time. Certainly a successful period of time. I think six promotions um, at Wimbledon, no relegations. Um, you know, probably something five hundred thousand plus in transfer fees, probably brought in profit. You know, so I'd I'd done a good job. Um, so yeah, and and, I, and Wimbledon recognised that, and you know, again they gave me the caretaker manager's job that time. What's your win ratio this time? Second yeah, time. Yeah, same. Two, two wins, and four. Two, two, two out of four. Two out of four. Yeah, so fifty percent. Four wins out of eight games. That's nationwide league conversion, isn't it? That's, yeah. That's league. That's league stats. Well, I'm, I'm think I'm, I'm in the playoffs over a season. <laughs> 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 no, but you know, brilliant. And and in a way, I probably make mistakes. In and around that time, I should have been more forceful with stuff because at that time, did I think I could do the job? Yes. Did I want to do the job? Yes. Um, but they never asked me to interview for the job this time. On a full-time basis? No. Um, do you think they already had an idea of who they wanted to come in as coach? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They, well, say so yeah. They interviewed three or four um I think they was pretty underwhelmed with the three or four that the choice was. They'd agreed to give it to someone. Um, I was told that they were giving it to him and he would work. I would work with him and his assistant to the end of the season. Um, and then he turned it down. Um, yeah, so, and then obviously he came and Wally Downs got the job. And came in and got the and got the job. So now Wally Downs, Wimbledon legend, from the old days, uh, must have been a big hero yourself growing up as not, well. Not really, because he didn't really play when when I watched him. Okay, uh, he was kind of he was kind of still around uh, the squads. I think at that time, but I think yeah. he'd had a lot of injuries, a couple of broken legs and stuff. So he didn't really he wasn't really one that I'd see playing. Glenn Hodges, who who came in, Glenn <clears throat> was was in the team that I kind of watched but Wally I didn't really see him play he was um, coming towards the back end of his career yeah I think he was he, yeah. I think obviously he gets on well with Dave Bassett and I think his, his character at the time was was what they kept him around for um, but I didn't really see him play so yeah I, I didn't know Wally but I knew people who, who did um, I didn't know Glyn but I knew people who did and um, yeah so that was the sort of next chapter but yeah, I brought Stephen. I mean, I brought Stephen Reed in to work with me. Really? Um, yeah. We've um, had the pleasure of having Stephen Reed on the channel. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Love you. Okay. Fella. Yeah. So he's a a good friend of mine. Um, so he'd he'd left Crystal Palace a couple of maybe a couple of months before. Um, so I just rung him up and I said, "Listen, come on. Good little thing. Come and help me out. Um, you'll enjoy it, like." Yeah staff at Wimbledon, first class, you know, goalkeeping coach, physio, sports science, real good type group, um, and hard working, honest lads. So I said, come in, you'll love it, like. So Stephen came in and helped me, um, and was good. Ain't a bad signing, lad, is it? Nah, good signing. Ain't a bad signing. Good signing. Um, and he loved it, I must admit. And, you know, after when, when he'd sort of, when he'd left, he just said, do you know what, Bass, he said, I absolutely loved it. He said, I, he said, I, I really, really enjoyed it. He said, working with a small group. Yeah. He said, working with you guys. He said, it was brilliant. Uh, yeah, and we, and we done, say we done all right. Again, you know, uh, won the league game. We won an FA Cup game away at Halifax on the telly. So that was good for the club financially again. And obviously set up um, the next round of the FA Cup, which was Fleetwood. Who we beat, and then obviously we beat West Ham in the in the third round. So, yeah, it was a it was a good time, and then obviously Wally came in, and, and and things progressed from there. First meeting with Wally Downs as a coach. First impression. How did that go? Yeah, I fine. I mean, I just said to him, "What do you what do you want from me?" And he said, 
I'm not here to put anyone out of a job. Um, just be as much help as you can. So that's what you're on the way from a new manager, yeah, really. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you know, I, I work, as I say, I work hard for whoever I work for. You know, ultimately I work for AFC Wimbledon and gave my best and and I've done what I think was a good job for a long time. So, you know, I just carried on along that sort of route and, and got me head down and worked hard. Mm. The initial working relationship was good with Wally Downs. Well, it, we we didn't overly have overly have one, but he, you know, he said just get on with what you do, and you know, I, that's what I done. But kind of him and Glyn tended to sort a lot of stuff out, sort of privately, really. End of the season, then talk to me about the plan going forward with the club, with yourself, with your role involved with Wimbledon. Yeah, well. Um, end of the season, obviously we we achieved what we achieved. You know, we managed to stay up, which was again was another was another really good feat. You know, and that was kind of it was always the sort of dream of the club. There, there. Once we got them promoted, you know, we got them promoted from League Two. I think we were. I think the year before we'd finished fifteenth in League Two, and I think the chairman had asked Neil what what would it take to have a go at the playoffs, and Neil said. I think if you can get us a top half budget, um, we'd have a good go. And I think we ended up we were fourteenth in a budget table, and we managed to finish uh, seventh, get into the playoffs. Uh, obviously, go through through the playoff semi final drama with Accrington and everything that went with that, and then obviously to win at Wembley against Plymouth in front of eighty, I think it was I mean sixty thousand or whatever it was. Uh, Wimbledon fans, Plymouth fans, you know, great turnout, and to to see the club back at, at Wembley, you know, the last pl uh, the playoff final was at Manchester. To be at Wembley for this one and to get us to League One was was phenomenal. And again, was we ready to be have the budget? No, but as I said previously, you take it and and you you adjust, you know. And then that was our job when we was in League One. I think the plan was listen, just get us to. Plough Lane was the, always the dream, you know, it was becoming more of a reality at the time. So this was being, Plough Lane was being manifested. And yeah, being Plough Lane was to, being sort of, the fold. It, had, it had sort of, they broke the ground on Plough Lane, so we was, we was kind of ready to go back there coming in the next two or three years. Um, and the remit was, by hook or by crook, keep us in League One um, for when we get back to Plough Lane. And... Ultimately, Neil paid with his job. Um, when the results didn't go well this, that, that season, um, but thankfully, you know, we we managed to stay up that year with with Wally and Glyn and and myself. And then, you know, last year the league was obviously ended prematurely, but we've managed to get back to back to play our lane, which is the way to dream. When you think about it, from step nine to League One, yeah. It's, a, it's an unbelievable achievement yeah, it's a story I mean, in itself yeah I mean there was lots of rumours about um, film being made about it I think John Green who's the uh, author who's done a who would play you? <sighs> some handsome devil <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I don't know but we'd had you know we'd, we'd had sort of chats and stuff with some film people about it really? yeah it was that far along yeah, there, yeah. I think we'd they'd sort of sent contracts over that you'd sort of initially look at and and uh, but it's I think it's been shelved now for some reason um, which is disappointing um, but yeah so that was always the dream and to dream you know my ultimately my dream was to get back to Plough Lane uh, as first team coach of AFC Wimbledon and I had to get off the bus early and missed it so that was disappointing you know to leave when I did was disappointing can you explain to us about your exit, how things came about? Because it seems like quite a strange thing, having come so far with the club. Yeah, well... You're, you're, you're sort of, you've been caretaker manager twice, you've yeah. got that experience. Can you tell me how it came about? Yeah, you, only uh, the last game of the season at Bradford, we'd won. Um, while he was on the bus, got him a beer. The lads were sort of having a few beers. He said, uh, I'm staying up and we'll meet in a couple of days for a few beers. I said, yeah, no why, it's perfect. Um, that was on the Saturday, I think on the Monday. 
my phone went. It was uh, Chief Exec saying, we want, we want to see you. Um, and that was it, really. Went and see him. He said, we're not going to, we, we want you to, well, he don't want to work with you. He wants, uh, and that's it. You that know, can't shut. Yeah, that can't shut. You, you're gone, like, pretty much. So, uh, it's football, you know. Did I think it was fair? No. Was I hurt? Yes. Did I think I'd done a good job? Yes. Do you think it was a footballing decision or do you think it was a personal decision? Well, I, 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 do, well a bit, I do well to think it was a footballing decision um, because, you know, I think my time at Wimbledon says I'm not bad, you know. I'm good at my job. I'm good at a lot of jobs because I've done a lot of jobs at Wimbledon. Um, you know, and certainly I can um, go back to Wimbledon with my head held high. You know, if, you know, I was really pleased with what, what I've done. Because you are effectively Mr Wimbledon. You are someone that supported the club originally through, yeah. the, through the sort of the glory days to then through the dark ages to then the, the relative success they've yeah. had in the, the modern game. Yeah, I mean, as I say, there's lots of Mr Wimbledons, trust me. You work at that football club, there's some people there that, that do unbelievable things. Uh, I was a part of that. You know, I dedicated my life to it. Um... I worked beyond my job title for a long time, certainly beyond my pay grade for a long time uh, for the club because I love the club. It's my club, you know, it's a club I grew up supporting as a boy. Um, and it's a place where you spend time and you become really fond of it. And, you know, I loved Wimbledon. I still love Wimbledon. It's still my club. Uh, I still want them to win every week. But I was disappointed in how it ended, certainly. What I find really ironic is, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, is one ex-Wimbledon legend then ending the tenure of another Wimbledon legend, indirectly or directly, whatever way you want to look at it. I just find that a very, yeah. very strange set, well, set of surroundings, if yeah. I'm wording that right. I mean, I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong person to ask because I didn't make the decision. You know, I didn't want to leave. Yeah. You know, certainly. I fully my, appreciate that. Certainly, my role changed a bit you know in terms of my input and what I'd what I'd done as much you do, you, know. do you feel it was more closed shop then than what it was there he yeah, had a little his, bit. his sort of confidence and his his way yeah of well he had his assistant and it was a little bit kind of um them two and listen yeah. ultimately they'd done the job that was required of them you know he kept us up um that year my role kind of changed a little bit then I was more um although I still done some coaching um, was kind of more in with the uh, players again, you know, picking, um, picking people up, putting arms around them, you know, giving them a kick more up. More management, yeah, on that side kind of, of that thing. side of it, which which I'd done early on with Terry when Terry was manager because Terry I, at that stage I was probably twenty nine thirty yeah. and Terry was. So you could relate more to the I players. I could relate to the players when Terry Brown was manager, so I was that kind of buffer between the two. Yeah. Um, and I kind of went back to that role a little bit under, under Wally. Um, but yeah, as I say, disappointed it wasn't my choice. And, uh, you know, that's life. You move on. Now, having been such a big part of the club, having the club been, more importantly, such a big part of your life, how did you handle it mentally when you're not working for Wimbledon anymore? Bearing in mind you were a Wimbledon fan of the original Wimbledon. How did your mental health impact after that decision? Difficult, I must admit. It was really difficult. Really, um, I found it tough at times. i done a lot of reading, you know. I've got a, a place in Spain, a family place in Spain. Yeah. I went I went out there and spent some time on my own and tried to sort of think of what I wanted to do next and try and process what had happened kind of in a way when I look back now it, the break was been good for me yeah. because you know I'd done four or five jobs under one job title at Wimbledon for a long time you know I was first team coach for 12 years just over 12 years just over um, you know so seven days a week long hours you know I was head of recruitment at Wimbledon I, you know, I wasn't, but I was. You know, it wasn't my job, but it was. Um, so, 
it takes its toll and I don't think you until you come out of it you realize sort of what you put into it you know my holidays would be non-existent when I was with the family because you're already signing players you're watching players on the on the internet so that would be me twice a day two hours on the phone to agents um, trying to do deals or move people on trying to look at videos of new players so it's a real tumble dryer you know Wimbledon you, you're in it and it sort of spins you around and, and engulfs your life takes over and it certainly did me but you know I, I wouldn't regret any of it I'd do it again tomorrow you know I loved every minute of it um, yeah but it finished and, and you have to move on so um, yeah it took a bit of time um, but it is what it is have you worked in football as a coach or as a manager since your departure from Wimbledon? At the moment, no. I think it's 18 months probably since I left. Um, first three months, I've done nothing. Um, Do you think you suffered a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder, if that's the right word to phrase um, it, due to the situation and the shock of everything? No, I just think I'd probably burned myself out. And when you stop... Like a lot of times during the end of the seasons, I'd become ill. I'd get ill really? for a week because your sort of body would you'd finish and your body would shut down because you're used to the pressure. Yeah, you're used to the pressure and you're used to the speed of everything. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, at that time, I'd, I'd sort of you get through it, and ultimately you have to find. I'd always sort of had something to look forward to, whether it be signing players, watching players, uh, sorting pre-season out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. logistics, players, everything. You know, getting new players in. I used to find houses for them. Used to make sure they were settled. Used to do all of that sort of stuff as well, um, to make sure that they, their period, their experience of Wimbledon was a positive one. And you know, I'm big on environment. The environment you create for people. You know, you're a coach of players, but ultimately you're a coach of people. These are people. They're not players, and I mm. treat them as people. Mm. You know, I don't treat them as an object. They're a person before they're a player. So their well-being is important to me. You're also trying to get, like you said, preparing the right location, the right environment. Yeah, absolutely. Because right ultimately, everything that everything I can do that makes their experience better will hopefully enhance their performance on the pitch. You take all the yeah, yeah buts away from them, yeah. and you give them the best opportunity to be successful. And if there's if that's for, that works, brilliant. Because if they're successful, it ultimately means we're successful and. You know, that's the sort of environment we try to create. And, you know, we were we were honest with people, but respectful. We were firm with them. Um, but I'd like to say, I, I mean, you've seen some of the shirts around in here. Um, I've got a lot of friends, ex-players, who are, who I'd call friends, who, who still ring me up now. Um, and, you know, we, we chat and they're grateful for what I've done for them, which is, which is really good for me. I suppose it's a nice feeling to find that your friends were actually friends with you, not with your job. Yeah. Whenever someone leaves a position of high profile or of importance, it's, it's always strikes me it's just nice and to see who them them friends are well, and I how think, that, I that think friendship it's a, remains. It's a relationship you build, you know. You don't, yeah. although I was a coach and they were players and it was always a player-coach relationship, there was a real high level of respect. I treated them with the most respect you know, I expected them to do the same, and they did. Yeah. You know, you could look the boys like the Lyle Taylors of this world. You know, he was I think sixth, seventh choice striker at Scunthorpe when I brought him to Wimbledon for fifteen grand. He's now at Nottingham Forest, double European champions winners. Nottingham Forest, big move over the summer for him. Huge well, move. move you know, yeah. you know he, he's you know the money that he's getting is he, fantastic, and he deserves every penny. You know, that boy slogged it out in, in the back end of some nowhere, you know, to, f to find his dream. You know, Scumfort, Partick, Thistle, Falkirk, you know, Concord Rangers. He went everywhere to, to try and reach his goal. You know, we got him up to Wimbledon and, and loved him and put our arm around him and give him a kick up the backside when he needed to. But he was a fantastic kid. Really, really, really enjoyed working with him, you know, and got a great relationship with him you know he sends his shirt down as a thank you you know and I'm, I'm really pleased for him and I hope he does really well this year now I know your main thing is coaching 
Yeah. I know you enjoyed the process as well as the result. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself actively becoming involved in football in a coaching in a coaching role over the next sort of foreseeable year or so? Is that something that we can expect? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I uh, I was close to a couple of jobs in the summer. Um, one never worked logistically. I was out of the country at the time and um, couldn't get back um, with the lockdown quarantine kind of rules to to sort of really sort of take that job up so they went elsewhere um, and we I was close as a, a number two to a couple of jobs as well in the summer um, that never quite uh, materialised so yeah hopefully say coaching is is my passion I love that um, see when I left Wimbledon I started I was doing some recruitment work for Millwall um, which was good obviously they'd seen was that a senior level yeah, first team stuff, yeah. yeah. So, um, obviously they'd seen the stuff that I'd sort of, the players I'd brought through at Wimbledon and stuff like that. And I was do I was enjoying that. It wasn't, it's not the same, you know, because I liked finding them and then I'd take them back and, and work with them. them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my kind of love in a way. Um, so I missed that kind of part of it. But, you know, ultimately I, I had to get my face out there. I had to get me knowledge out there, keep working, you know, keep your knowledge high because you never know when the phone rings. When it rings, you need to be prepared. Um, and I do that, you know, I just said to you earlier, it's, it used to be my analysis room. It still is. I still watch two games a week, you know, on the platforms. I still watch most of the Wimbledon games um, after they've played, watch them back. And uh, any other good games that I think or players that I hear about, I'll... I'll I'll keep them on me here and watch them and take me notes down and hopefully, you know, fingers crossed when the next opportunity arises, I'll be, I'll be ready to go and, and armed with, with, uh, with another lot of knowledge. I just find it fascinating how you say you'd go out, find the player, then bring him back and develop him. Yeah. Sounds like you're playing football manager in real life. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, a great way to, it's a great yeah. way to think about it. Yeah, you know, and, and, and that's it, you know, you see... When you have an eye for a player, you, you see, uh, the first time I ever see Lyle Taylor play, he was sub for Hereford against Wimbledon in the conference. And he came on a sub, I think he was on loan from Bournemouth. He didn't do anything, but he moved beautifully. Just his balance, is just, that what struck you about he was the way just, he, he moved. glided. Yeah. And he was, he, he was when we took him back, but he just moved effortlessly, glided. And, and, I, and I'd followed his career from then. I thought, oh, Jesus. Sky were brilliant because they had all the Scottish goals, so I'd record them, I'd watch them back. So I watched all this Pike Thistle stuff, all this Falkirk stuff, kept an eye on him. When it came, you know, when we came to the point where we were looking for a, a centre forward and we had the, the sort of resources to get it, he was the one I said to uh, Neil Wardley at the time, Have a look at this kid, I really like him. And uh, I think he ran me back 15 minutes later and went, yeah, you're one percent right. And the rest is history. And the rest is history, yeah, yeah. But you know, and you say he's gone on to wonderful things. But there's, you know, there's a lot of other good players who, who we've come in and done well for, and uh, I'm pleased for all of them. You know. Want to talk a little bit about Plough Lane? Mm -hmm. The ground after COVID restrictions is going to be open. Yep. I'm guessing you're going to be going as a fan, getting yourself a season yep. ticket. Well, I, I went to the first game as a co-commentator for BBC Radio Did London. You really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I've done a bit of, I say, <coughs> during a period where I'm not working, I'm sort of doing lots of other stuff. So, so like some comms, some comms work? Done some co-commentary yeah, work, work. Some Alan Ellis work. Yeah. Um, I've been into some companies um, looking at leadership and stuff like that. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, just trying to improve, keep learning. You know, every day's a school day, so to speak. Um, keep Indeed. trying to get your skill set high. And as I say, hopefully when the phone call comes, uh, you're ready to go and, and, and ready to do another good job. Why have they made it so from all the flats at Plough Lane, you can't see the pitch? From every one, it's angled so you can't I see the know, pitch. How not... is that possible? This, this, this is what I've, I've been... Well, I, 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 don't, I think the ones behind, if you come out of the tunnel, the ones behind the left, they look like... They're, for me, it looked like they had frosted windows. Did they? It looks like a bathroom window. I was trying to have a look at it, but not the bathroom window, but... Yeah, you know I don't know. Mean. It'd be interesting to find out, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's a it's a beautiful stadium. It looks amazing, doesn't it? Looks it? amazing. I've seen some pictures of the um, 
people have had drones and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Put pictures online. Yeah, I've seen fantastic. all of them. <clears throat> when you go, you know, I've said it somewhere else, that like the Bobby Robson quote about the young boy walking up the steps, you see, you know, the dons on the seats, the grass, it's beautiful. The, the flats, I wasn't sure about at first, you know, you think flats, all them flats. But it, I think it kind of helps because that side's so not, it's only 10 rows, I think, of seats. Yeah. So the roof comes down, but the flats give it height, so mm -hmm. it's kind of keeps. It looks like it's going to be quite intimidating. Quite, you know, the pitch is close anyway, but the flats seem to draw everything in again. So I mean, hopefully, yeah. So fingers crossed, fans can come back as soon as possible, and uh, and they, let's just say, what Wimbledon fans have achieved is is sensational. You know, from. You know, starting the club to going through to get into player lane. When you think of where they was Absolutely, when the club yeah. left to go to to Milton Keynes yeah. or relocated, whatever yeah. way you want to word it. Yeah. When you think of how and where they started to where they are now. Yeah. It's a fantastic testament fantastic. to success and to, to a, hard work. Yeah, and and, and that's as I say I said earlier. You spend time with these people, you know, the, the love for the club is 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 never ending. You know, the time people put in is is fantastic. I mean. In a in a pandemic, they're eleven million short. The club find the fans then bond through the bond scheme find five point two million pounds of their their own money. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Not to be downplayed. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the only disappointment now that they go back to Plough Lane without without them people because they're the, they're the actual people that you know. We talk about a fan stadium. That's a fans owned, fans built, fans funded stadium and. You know, it's going to be brilliant for everyone. First ever game of football I ever watched in my life was at Plough Lane. Okay. Wimbledon versus Oldham. Right. So I think that must have been like 89. Right, right. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, 88, 89. 89, yeah, I was probably Maybe there. 90. Yeah, I was probably there. Yeah, I was there. So to, just to go back and sit in the ground again, watch a good yeah. standard of football there is yeah. going to be fantastic. Fantastic, as well. yeah. yeah. As I say, from, from where they've come to, I mean, they're talking about... Sandhurst was the first game and yeah. people standing on hay bales around the pitch to see, you know, to come full it's circle incredible. to back to Plough Lane is, is, uh, is unbelievable. And, and hopefully, fingers crossed, to say, I always thought our job was to get to Plough Lane in League One. We've achieved that now, you know, obviously with last year as well. So, you know, f should hopefully, fingers crossed, be a real good uh, period to now maybe start laying some foundations and trying to build the club you know it's been difficult the way the clubs escalated through the leagues it's been tough for, for everything to catch up with the first team you know with the, the youth team to catch the first yeah. teams are because the bar raises every week every yeah. every other season you're You've in a different up. league yeah. now you're not you ain't, can't be good enough for a conference now you've got to be good enough for league two yeah. and then you get to you can't be good enough for league two now we're in league one you know so where we are, this may be the ceiling. I don't know. You Do know, you think, as fans owned, it might be the ceiling as a League One football club. I don't know. Do you think the infrastructure of the club, we know, like the training facilities, the training ground, are all that going to be improved? Have you any well, knowledge? Well, I mean, you can tell to be fair, that? Neil Wildley's got to take a lot of credit. The, the training ground, we improved it fantastically. You know, for what it for what it is, it was perfectly functional. We had a decent gym. You know, it was okay. It was it was workable. Uh, change rooms were fine. Uh, we kept trying to improve the food every year. Uh, the training pitches. We put a lot of money into the training pitches. So you know, for for where it is for League One, could it be better? Yeah. Is it is it workable? Absolutely. You know, could it have a few quid spent on it to get a few bits and pieces? Yeah, certainly. But everything we we kind of. You try to have everything went to the first team budget because it wasn't competitive enough. Yeah. You know, so there was stuff that you'd kind of will get that instead of that. The money was allocated because to it the was, first team. Yeah, because it yeah. was cheaper, and then you know you'd you'd be able to get a better centre forward or, you know. I get it. But hopefully now you know maybe that can, with the extra income that Plough Lane will have, uh, will generate once the fans go back in. Maybe there can be. Uh, some improvements done to it but 
So yeah. it'll be really exciting to see the club have a policy of playing youth players going forward. So we see the club developing the <coughs> oh, talent. Yeah. It's a massive catchment area for players. Absolutely. Yeah, we've here. developed, to be fair, we've developed talent through my time there as well, you know. We I had, won't digging you out. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> we had, uh, we, but ultimately, then, the club sold them. We sold them to make money. because to generate. We, to generate the money, to keep yeah. going forward. You know, the Ryan yeah. Sweeney's, <coughs> see Joe Bursick, yeah. uh, the goalkeeper, played for England under 21s yesterday. Um you know, came through the academy, but was sold on before he, before he got his really pro. Really made a name for himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Ryan Sweeney the same. There's been others. Tom Beers played in the first team. Will Nightingale came through um, previously with Neil Wardley and stuff. Um, and, and there was others. Anthony Hartigan who's playing in and out of the team now. He was playing in as a 17-year-old. So it, it, we've always played them if we can. Ultimately, James, they've got to be good enough. You know, and that's always the thing. When you're at this level, you know, they have to be good enough. And there's a big argument between, you know, how do you know if they're not good enough if you don't play them? But as I said to you, our focus You've was... You've got to hit the ground running, Of course you have. But our focus yeah. was, our goal was, just be in the League One when we get to play our lane. You know, and then you, hopefully now, as you say, they've got some good kids about now. Jack Radoni's come in and done well. Yeah. Um, Hartigan, as I say, is still playing. And there'll be a few others to, you know, so... You know, great if they can bring them through. And again, they've had a, they've had a few more years of development. You know, along with it. You know, this this group here now will probably, in the in and around the club when it became a professional football club, rather than, yeah. you know, when we was in the conference. <clears throat> no disrespect, but a Sunday morning. It was a really a Sunday morning team. The youth set up then. Yeah. So the youth setup's done brilliant to come along with the club and produce players. You know, and there's some talented boys in there. You know, Tyler Brewery we sold to um, to Millwall, you know, just because they wanted the money. We needed the money. So, you know, fingers crossed there can be some youngsters uh, in the team and, and, and good luck to them. I've got to say, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about your career and life today. And it's been fascinating to hear some of the, the stories and some of the stuff that went on during your time at the club. If you could relive one day of your football life, like Groundhog Day, have you seen yeah. that film? Yeah. What would your Groundhog Bill Day Murray. be? Uh, I'd prob I'd just say I'd probably say we touch it. I'd probably say Manchester. I th I'd probably the playoff final. The playoff final. The group we had in League Two to get into League One was the best group I've ever worked with, in terms of players, in terms of ability, in terms of character, in terms of people was a fantastic, unbelievable group of players. Um, but I'd probably say, what, if it, what, for what it meant to me and to the club, that day in Manchester uh, was unbelievable. Because I say, I, I could only see us after that, if we didn't win, finding it tougher, you know. Mm. And uh, that kept us going forward, kept the momentum and obviously secured the financial difference between a conference club and a league two club is huge you know so for us to get all that funding again we talk about the youth policy the funding you get from the football league to be in it for your youth policies is fantastic so i'd probably say yeah probably the manchester uh, day night and day after would uh, <laughs> were quite good um but the group say that group at uh at wembley was uh was the best group I've ever worked with in terms of fellas, proper fellas, a lot of them, you know, real good guys. Um, and I say the bond that them boys have got will stay with them forever. You know, they they call themselves the Wolf Pack, <laughs> them them chaps, and uh, they'll stay for life. The Wolf Pack, I'm sure. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, especially in football. Is there a decision that you wish you could change? whether that be something you did or something that you didn't do regarding an opportunity or something to do with your footballing career? Uh, probably, from a playing point of view, I probably, I don't think I'd have, I don't think I'd have ever drunk when I was playing. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Because um, I was not a bad drinker um, in them days. I'll probably I wouldn't drink if I was playing again. Yeah, uh, I guess that's to do with the times as well that you played in the new yeah, era. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, maybe. And just say I'm I'm one of them. I I was kind of I was in it, you know. I was in with the lads. Um, yeah, of course. So that that would, from a playing point of view, that would be it. From a coaching point of view, I'd probably say I would probably have been a try to be a bit more forceful in my end at Wimbledon in terms of you know trying to maybe put myself forward for the job at that at that stage when it was. Uh, have you ever heard the saying that uh, closed mouths don't get fed? Yeah. Do you think that that, that applied yeah. to you a little bit? With yeah, your in a way. The end of your Wimbledon team. In a way, you know, and I, yeah. I never really, I say, telling people what I've done or what I do ain't my style. No, it's never that. been, you know, I've never been one. Yeah. You know, um, self praise is no praise, as my dad says. Um, I'm not one who goes around telling everyone what I've done, what I do. You know, I'm good at my job, blah blah blah. I just get on and work hard. I appreciate um, that. And we had a big saying at Wimbledon, selfless, not selfish. You know, give yourself to the cause greater than you. Um, and I'd done that. I lived that to the letter. Um, did it stand me in good enough stead? Probably at the time. Now, no. Um, but yeah, you live and learn. Um, and say what happens, happens. And you and you move on. I say I'm disappointed, but, you know, I've got memories that were maybe I never thought I'd ever get. And you know, I'm I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people. It's, I've achieved I've achieved a lot more than a lot of people ever will in in football, and, and certainly for my team as well. You know, six promotions, you know, seven hundred games as a first team coach, just over probably. You know, I've I've got a lot of great memories, and as you say, I can look in the mirror of what I achieved at Wimbledon, and I'll be really really happy with it. If the opportunity ever came up for you to go back to Wimbledon in some capacity. Would you really consider it? Is it something that you thought about? Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a club I love. You know, it's broke my heart twice. Um, once as a child, once as an adult. Once as a child, once as an adult. Yeah, I appreciate you that. You know, how many times you keep going back, but as you say, it's your first love, so to speak. Um, so, it's an I'm, I'm not sure that phone call will come. If it did, I'm pretty sure I'd entertain it. Um, in what role that would be, I wouldn't know. Yeah. So I mean, I've got to say, I really appreciate your openness and honesty in answering my questions. I've really enjoyed spending no worries, some time mate. with you. No, no worries, James. Thanks ever so much for having us on, mate. I look forward to catching you up again real soon. Thank you, mate. Thanks ever so much.